Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. Today, we're going to take a look at terrain analysis. So what is terrain analysis? Well, if you dust off an old copy of everyone's favorite doctrine publication, Joint Pub 2-03, also affectionately known as Geospatial Intelligence and Joint Operations, the textbook definition reads, the collection, analysis, evaluation, and interpretation of geographic information on the natural and man-made features of the terrain, combined with other relevant factors to predict the effect of the terrain on military operations. This definition can be found in the exact same publication that we are reading this from. Gotta love it when the publication cites itself. Now, since this definition was clearly written by a staff officer looking to get a promotion, what does this actually mean in English? Well, it's pretty simple. Terrain analysis is looking at the ground and figuring out how it's going to affect both your operations and those of an enemy force. Terrain analysis is actually part of a larger doctrine, which many people might know as METTC. This is yet another widely used acronym that is used to understand the mission planning process. We can go over this another time, but for now, just know that terrain analysis is a very important step in planning operations. As we all know, the U.S. military loves its extremely broad and rather unhelpful terminology, but also loves its acronyms. So we have a very mildly helpful acronym to help explain what terrain analysis actually looks like. And this acronym comes from the Crayon Eaters over at the United States Marine Corps Office of the Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration. Don't forget to add these guys to your Christmas card list because they are responsible for producing the only true Little Red Book that's worth reading, the U.S. Marine Corps core reference publication 12-10b.1, Military Operations on Urbanized Terrain. In this literary gem, we find the acronym COCO, which outlines all of the steps of terrain analysis. So as we go down this acronym, let's hop on over to the map to show what this actually looks like in practice. Alrighty then, now that we've got a good map to work from, let's go over the acronym that will help us work our way through the terrain analysis for this particular area. But not so fast. Remember, I mentioned that terrain analysis itself is actually a part of another process, or technically part of several processes. Terrain analysis is part of intelligence preparation of the battle space, which is part of METTC, which is nestled under the doctrine of operations, really. So for this example, let's set a few parameters so that we can actually make sense of the terrain analysis for this location. Firstly is our mission. In this example, the context of our mission is home defense during a time of civil unrest or during clearance operations or something like that. On the map, this house will be our home. We are also going to assume that our defenses will be hasty in nature. After all, most of us do not live in a house that was prepared by Kevin McAllister. Alright, so let's finally get to it. The acronym that we will be using to establish a hasty terrain analysis of our operational environment is COCO. And the first letter, K, stands for Key Terrain. Whipping out yet another publication, ADP 3-90, we can define Key Terrain as an identifiable characteristic whose seizure or retention affords a marked advantage to either combatant. The classic examples of Key Terrain include things like airports, stadiums, parks, sports fields, schools, public buildings, road junctions, bridges, industrial facilities, railways, power substations, and so much more. If you really drill down to the micro terrain of a specific area, you could include things like individual street lamps, manhole covers, security cameras, and other very specific and insanely detailed items. Remember, work expands to fill the time allotted. So if we are smart and conduct our terrain analysis before it's actually needed, we won't be rushing around in a panic when things go sideways. But let's say that we didn't do that, and civil unrest in our city is imminent. If we had more time, maybe we could put more things on the map, but for now we're just going to have to do this very quickly. I should also take a moment to mention that in addition to key terrain, we also need to consider decisive terrain. Decisive terrain is a type of key terrain, but it is a terrain feature that absolutely must be conquered in order for an engagement to be decisive, or it's terrain that if it were captured, it would lead to a decisive engagement. In this example, the only decisive terrain that we would highlight is the house itself, because if we lose control of the house, if we cede that key terrain to the enemy, we lose. Our mission has failed, right? So let's quickly drop some markers on the key terrain that we can see. 
If you like, you can pause the video and highlight all of the key terrain items that you can see and compare to what we have sketched out just here in a few seconds. Since public buildings, or really all commercial buildings as well, are very quick to be looted and set on fire, we're going to go ahead and mark those. These three buildings look like they're either some kind of government building or a public building, some kind of business, so we're going to highlight those. Major intersections are often also targeted by rioters because they are choke points and blocking them can restrict movement through an area. We're also going to locate any potential vantage points as rioters have been known to take advantage of these locations. And if someone is going to take any high ground that can affect us, we want to know about it. And finally, not pictured is the utility access points. There isn't any example of these access points on this example map, but I did want to mention that it's one of the first things we look for, particularly in the context of defense against civil unrest. Rioters have been known to disrupt public utilities during their fiery but mostly peaceful protests. Electrical substations, transformer boxes, manholes, water access points, fire hydrants, all of these things would be critical to drop on a map because they have been historically primary targets for malign actors. Up next is observation and fields of fire. As the Mount Handbook so eloquently puts it, urbanized terrain is characterized by restrictive observation and fields of fire. In other words, in the urban landscape, most of the time you're going to have a piss poor view from your position, and there's not much you can do about it. The urban landscape also severely restricts the ranges of most weapon systems. And even if you aren't planning on utilizing particularly long-range weapons for your defense, most military doctrine does not separate observation from fields of fire. In most cases, it's essentially the same thing. So let's drop some sectors of fire around our house here. Remember, just because you're sketching out sectors of fire from your bedroom does not mean that you're planning for World War III to break out, even though it couldn't hurt in that case. Simply preparing range cards for each observation port or window in your home would be very helpful in the event that you have to hunker down for a civil unrest event. Obviously, it would be handy to have overlapping fields of view so that each position can cover the one next to it. Again, this sounds like overkill, but in this simple exercise, it's very handy for determining blind spots and places where an adversary can sneak up on you, like this area highlighted in orange. Blind spots present vulnerabilities, and the first step in mitigating those vulnerabilities is finding out that they exist, which is why sketching out your limits of observation is quite handy. Up next is cover and concealment. Cover provides a physical barrier between oneself and an adversary, offering some protection from incoming fire. Concealment, on the other hand, instead of relying on a physical barrier to keep one safe, concealment relies on camouflage to hide your location. In other words, an enemy can't hit what they can't see. Cover can be concealed. Think of a hidden bunker underground. But concealment itself doesn't provide cover from hostile attacks. In the urban environment, cover is everywhere, but pure concealment, eh, not so much. We have talked about the difficulties of urban camouflage efforts in a previous video, but the short version is that the urban landscape is not conducive to the fundamentals of camouflage. Almost all warfare doctrine that talks about the urban landscape relies heavily on using cover as concealment. Walls, structures, parked vehicles, or even subterranean features like sewage drainage ditches are really the primary things that we think of when we think of cover in the urban landscape. But again, we're not just marking down where we could hide, but where an adversary could hide or take cover if they decide to engage us. So we'll mark a couple of points on the map here that provide good cover and good line of sight to our position. And if we were really slick, we could number these points or give them code names so that if we had to yell over the radio, contact small arms from Point Delta, everyone who was participating in our home defense plan would know exactly what we mean. And anyone listening in on the radio wouldn't know what we're talking about. Up next is obstacles. With this one, we can get quite creative. In a traditional textbook military operation, obstacles are anything that restricts movement. This can be for people or for vehicles. Normally when we think of obstacles, we think of things like landmines and tank hedgehogs, but for most of us, we, we don't live on Omaha Beach, and there is not a lot of concertina wire in most residential neighborhoods. So for our citizen-based defense plan, we can think of things that could be used as obstacles. For instance, we all remember the pallets of bricks that mysteriously showed up in a lot of cities the night before a major riot was scheduled, so we can apply this real-world experience to our own plans. 
Think of things that can be used to immobilize first responders. Uh, remember during the riots of 2020, many rioters in many locations from Portland to Minneapolis were observed setting up barricades for the sole purpose of preventing fire trucks and medical vehicles from getting close to arson activities. So for our map here, we're not so much concerned with what obstacles are currently in place, but where barricades could be set up to do the most damage to ourselves or our community. And fortunately, if we identified the key terrain correctly in the first step, we've got a pretty good idea as to where an enemy would emplace their obstacles. In this step, we can also highlight what we call canalizing terrain, also called choke points. Canalizing terrain is a location that restricts travel from many different routes, down to really just one path. Canalizing terrain is a massive force multiplier if you recognize it and take advantage of it. But the inverse is also true. Canalizing terrain is the number one requirement for any ambush to be set up, so being able to recognize canalizing terrain is crucial for not just home defense, but for so many other things as well. Also, we can keep in mind where we ourselves would place obstacles to mitigate our vulnerabilities. In this case, we already know that the orange circle there designates a blind spot, so we could simply park a vehicle right here, which would at least provide some barrier to entry. But remember, you don't want your own obstacles to provide a barrier to you if you need to abandon your house and escape in a hurry. In this example, I myself would love to string up some razor wire all around the house, leaving small hidden gaps for emergency egress. But in the modern world, this presents a gargantuan legal risk. So if you're considering placing obstacles to prevent your position from being overrun, please be mindful that our court system does not currently look favorably on things like defense. And a good general rule of thumb for all obstacles is to never leave an obstacle unattended. And as always, check your local laws. And finally, we have avenues of approach. Again, in the urban environment, finding the key terrain earlier will help with this process quite significantly. Really what we are looking for with this step is what we call high-speed avenues of approach. In this example, we're talking about major roads. This is something that people really have a hard time grasping the importance of. Speed is a massive force multiplier. Think about it this way. How quickly can a SWAT team drive from their headquarters right to your door? How long would that take? In most cities, mere minutes if they were so motivated. Now think about the same question, but in a different location. If you lived in extremely rugged terrain high up in the Rocky Mountains, how long would it take for a raiding force to physically get to you then? Probably a lot longer. When it comes to specifically urban unrest, rioting, and looting, a huge factor is public transportation. Many fiery but peaceful protests have begun with malign actors using public transportation to ingress into the operational area. Sounds a lot more like a legit military operation once we start using operational terms to describe things, huh? But anyway, knowing where the bus routes are and what times the buses run would be very important information to know. And this final step is where things can expand quite significantly beyond the borders of this small map that we are showing here. When we annotate these high-speed avenues of approach, we really want to extend these routes out to the outskirts of a city. So what we want to know is, if an adversarial force were to travel from another city, how long would it take for them to transit from the outskirts to our front door? And what routes would they most likely take? Again, we also need to do this for our own team. What routes can we take to emergency egress from our house to outside the city? Remember the rioting from last year. A lot of people were stuck in traffic trying to egress from urban centers in the wake of a riot being announced. And people were also stuck in traffic trying to escape cities to relatives in rural locations when the lockdowns began in various cities and states around the country. These escape routes do not have to be the same as the high-speed approach routes. In fact, they will most likely vary widely based on time of day, traffic, weather, and actions by the adversary. We also do not want to neglect the low-speed approach routes. A person traveling on foot can physically move over a lot more rugged terrain or difficult terrain than a vehicle can. So it is very important to be mindful of those blind spots, foot traffic routes, and places where a person could exploit your weaknesses to gain entry. Now we see how this is all coming together. Do these avenues of approach go near any of the cover and concealment options that we highlighted earlier? Or do these approaches pass through a blind spot that we discovered when sketching out our fields of observation? Or do these avenues of approach go through any canalizing terrain that we discovered previously? 
terrain that maybe we can take advantage of if we need to shift out of a defensive role. So that's the COCO process. Now there are a few caveats. First off, one of the most, if not the most, important mission planning factor is weather. Weather is such a limiting factor that it is usually the number one go no go criteria for mission planning, which is why we have dedicated a few videos already to this important topic and why we will continue to do so. Weather can quite literally change all of the analysis that you have already done. Avenues of approach can flood, fields of observation can be limited by smog, concealment can be blown away by the wind, or cover can be eroded away by rainstorms. Weather can create obstacles such as fallen trees, and key terrain can be restricted from being occupied due to ground freezing or flooding or storms or any other number of weather factors. Time of day is also a huge factor. The same route that is traversable during the day might not be so during the nighttime, and concealment that works at night might stick out like a sore thumb during the daytime. So we cannot forget the impact that weather and time of day can have on this process. We also have to remember that even though we can plan things down to the tiniest level, the enemy also has a say in how the battle goes. No plan, however well thought out, survives first contact, so when the rioting starts or the door-to-door -door operations begin, most of your plans will have to be adapted on the fly, which is a lot easier than starting the planning process from scratch. It's not very productive to sit down and have a well-planned brainstorming session when a rioter is throwing molotovs at your house or there is a boot on your door. Of course, this process is not an exact science. In fact, most branches of the military have this process in a different order or worded slightly differently or using a different acronym. So even the entity that we are getting this process from, the U.S. military, cannot agree on one succinct doctrine. So take a look around and start thinking about this process. Even just beginning to think about this stuff is a great way to make sure that you are prepared no matter what happens.